I've lived in Holland my whole life and it's pretty sad to come out here and see cigar butts, cigarettes, and different cigar tips just littered throughout. You don't really notice it until you start looking down and trying to actually see the plastic that's buried in the sand. And once you do, you realize that it's just about everywhere. In this section of river, you know, once you get through downtown, this is every other log jam, it's the same story. Just look at this one little spot right here. How many plastic bottles and garbage bags are in here? It's, it all flushes out into Lake Michigan. It's a huge issue. Today we're in South Haven. This is North Beach. It's a very popular beach, draws lots of people uh, weekdays and weekends. It's a beautiful spot, but unfortunately, if you look closely at the sand, you're gonna find a lot of small plastic pieces uh, It's just sort of buried in the, in the beach. Most people just walk over it, don't even notice. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna spend 10 minutes, we're gonna sift through the sand in this area behind me, and we're gonna see how much plastic we can come up with. So after 10 minutes, we found a pretty good uh, collection of plastic uh, fragments and bits and pieces of stuff here on the beach. We've got bottle caps and uh, cigar tips. Uh, we, get, we got a bunch of nurdles or these uh, plastic um, pre-manufactured pellets, uh, things that, that are not littered. They, they come from the, the water and are presumably are spilled somewhere in the manufacturing supply chain. Those nurdles um, are the very beginning of the harm that's caused, right? So the nurdles themselves find their ways outside of the factories, whether it's um, on the transportation to the factories or at the, in the factories, then go through rivers and streams and end up in Lake Michigan. We find them in when we do cleanups. In fact, there was a great study by some colleagues in uh, Ontario that more than 65% of the beaches they looked at across the Great Lakes, they found pre-production pellets. And what's interesting about them is that they're, they're not just like the disintegrated water bottles. They actually are coated with chemicals that are especially toxic. So we want to make sure that they don't find their ways into our waterways. And this waterway is our drinking water. For as long as we've had kind of plastic as a, a widespread and um, sort of common feature of our lives, as long as we've been using it and having its, its benefits, we've also experienced the pitfalls which um, have to do with what happens when it gets into the environment. So the study of plastic litter is kind of receiving a lot of attention lately. But in fact, the, the phenomenon of plastic litter occurring has been with us since plastic has been with us. You know, the first observations about plastic um, litter that got a lot of attention were in the ocean. Um, there was something called the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. I think that was one of the first kind of really widespread um, uh, kind of communication. I think it was easy for us to separate, you know, our environment and our activities from what's going on, uh, you know, on a uninhabited island in the Pacific Ocean. There was a kind of a geographic and a conceptual disconnect there. But uh, studies that go on in, in rivers in our backyard or, or in the Great Lakes um, kind of remove that illusion that we're separate from that problem. In fact, um, it's the same problem. Our trash in the Great Lakes, the plastic litter and other materials, is really literally ours. We can't blame it on um, some other country in the world. It's, it's from us. It's our, it's our municipalities, it's our, our neighbors, it's ourselves. You know, this is the trash that we generate and it's in our backyard, literally. So um, that is a key distinction. It narrows down, you know, the scope of responsible parties to communities in the U.S. and Canada. And I think it can offer um, some hope too because it means that if the sources are from us then then we have the solutions potentially at hand as well. When we're doing this work we kind of conclude that there's there's a lot of sources of plastic and microplastic to the environment and that can be 
distressing. That's one conclusion to draw. But I think another way to take that um, bit of information is to say, well, then there are there are just as many potential solutions. Um, so there isn't really a single way of eliminating this problem, but there's a whole host of different um, potential activities to engage in. Break free from plastics is a, a, a wonderful big piece of legislation in Congress right now that we um, strongly support. It really gets at the prevention side as opposed to the cleanup side. We want to stop the pollution before it starts. That is cost effective and it's smart, right? It's a lot harder to, to find those pellets as you just described in the waterways after they're there than to prevent them from getting them from the start. That's holding producers responsible for the things that they make and that's what we want to do. We want to go upstream and we really think that that's the most efficient way to do it. We just saw a recent study that was saying that um, doing that, moving towards reuse to things like this and away from single use, saves around five billion dollars for cities and towns around the country and produces 200,000 jobs. So that savings of $5 billion and their earning of nearly 200,000 jobs, we also think that's a good math and the smart way to move forward.